We'll get started here in about a minute or so. For those that have just joined, I'm putting a link in the chat for you. Um, and please follow the instructions on your screen to sign in using our new sign in form. If you've already done so, you do not need to do it again. Just putting it in for anybody that has joined after that first link was sent. Okay, Heidi, I will stop sharing and turn it over to you to share your screen. You oh, you're, uh, Jake, you're fine to share. Okay. I can, yeah. Great. Thank you. All, All right. right, go ahead. Thanks, Jake. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon to discuss uh, what you all did in regards to the Medication Quality Initiative. I'd also like to thank our four panelists. So Rebecca um, from Perf uh, Answer Health, uh, so she's a CMA. Kim from Henry Ford, uh, RN. Nadia from Livingston Physician Organization, PharmD. And then Lindsay, another RN from Huron Valley Association. So thank you so much for being here and, and being willing to share uh, what you did. Um, so jumping right in, I just want to make sure, Jake, uh, do we have all the panelists here uh, before I... Good question. Okay. Becca, I see Kim, Nadia. Uh, do I believe see? so. Okay. All right. So um, for the four of you, I'd like you each to... Um, explain what your goal was around uh, your medication QI project, uh, the process that you um, instituted and if it was successful. Um, so if anyone wants to volunteer, happy to let you volunteer or I can call on people. I can go first, no one Thanks. else is gonna go. <laughs> All right, um, Answer Health set the goal of increasing uh, prescribing frequencies of GLP-1s and SGLT-2 medications by 10% um, for the year 2024. We plan to focus on um, mostly being the patients that had A1Cs greater than 8%. And we also wanted to have an additional focus of the uh, practices that were a little bit lower performing. As, as far as the process changes that we implemented, we were striving for qu uh, quarterly meetings with our practices to review our goal focus, um, reviewing process changes and identifying any barriers at that time and working through them. And as far as if we were successful or not, um, I would say yes, we um, did have a PO uh, admin lead staffing change mid-cycle, um, which I came into the role. Um, however, despite just a short gap, we were able to successfully um, continue to work on the process changes. We increased the level of communication with our practices. And uh, once the data refresh is available, um, I'll be able to further evaluate um, and determine how successful our prescribing rates um, are looking in this first half of 2024. Wonderful. Thank you, Rebecca. And we'll be excited to hear uh, how that turns out. Um, who would like to go next? Kim, Lindsay, Nadia? Sure, this is Kim from Henry Ford. I can go next. Okay. So our goal was just a little bit more broad as far as we didn't target a specific um, classification of medication. Um, what we targeted was making sure that the providers had the tools that they needed in place to um, be able to prescribe the correct um, treatment pathway. So what we did is we created what we called our road show and we developed a standardized presentation that we took to each one of our clinics just because our PO is quite large. And so we encompass, you know, all of Henry Ford. So we took that road show out and had time on each one of the agendas in front of all of the providers. We reviewed with them the updated 2024 um, ADA standards of care. Um, 
and then reviewed with them the processes that we have in place at Henry Ford to support and assist with prior authorizations, hopefully removing that barrier for them. And I will say that um, it was successful in the fact that we were able to get on all of the agendas and we were able to get time in front of all of the physicians. Um, and it did increase, I guess, how we inter are able to interact with each one of the, um, the clinics that we support. So, so I, I say, yes, we were, we were successful and next year we'll, we'll take that one step further, I think. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Lindsay, Nadia, who wants to go next? I can go next. This is Lindsay Kleinstra from HVPA Village MD. We had we we stepped into um, this a little late in the game. We had a rather new team takeover, so our goal was to really reevaluate where we were at and kind of next steps around um, our medications, especially working with our pharmacy team around um, Jardians prescribing and those on dual. Di diabetic medications or weight loss medications. So that um, has been our major change. We've developed some materials and handouts as well as some reporting around that goal um, to help um, ha our patients control their blood sugar more accurately as well as decrease mm -hmm. our medication spend and concentration on GLP-1 prescribing. Um, so far, it's been very successful. We've had um, a lot of really good feedback from our practices and providers. We've um, been working very closely with our central pharmacy team, and we're very fortunate to have a central pharmacy team. Um, but that has been our main approach at this point. Wonderful. Thank you, Lindsay. All right. Last but not least, Nadia. All right. Um, so I'm going to speak more to what our goals for for our practice itself. Um, our main goals were to initiate SGLT2s and GLP1s for patients earlier in their diagnosis um, instead of kind of like waiting and, and just starting metformin and then come back three months later and see how it goes. So that was really one of our goals for pretty much all of the patients that we had just see regularly. Um, and anybody, even with new diagnosis, we start those conversations a lot earlier now. And um, so that's, you know, me, I'm a clinical pharmacist. We have our PA, um, Heather, who's also on the call today, and um, our physician who we all kind of discussed it, got on board really early to make those changes earlier as we see patients. Um, and I think so far it's been really successful. Patients have, I think, a much better understanding of the reasons why we want to start these medications early uh, instead of just kind of like waiting and seeing what happens with their blood sugars and stuff like that. So that's been, I think, really helpful for our patients. Wonderful. Thank you, Nadia. Um, all right. So we're going to um, switch to some individual questions. So first up is Rebecca. Um, you kind of uh, shared some of these things when you were outlining your, um, you know, 10% increase goal, but what worked well for you or any, any things that you walked away with when trying to implement another uh, QI initiative? Sure. Um, I kind of feel like just communication in general. So as I learned more about the QCI or CQI, sorry, and what my role entails, as well as what the various practice roles were, um, I was able to prioritize communication at that point with the practice champions and liaisons. Um, I held the check-in meetings um, virtually, and I also have some virtual um, quarterly office hours scheduled upcoming. Um, that way anyone can log in, ask questions, um, get confirmations or clarifications, um, or kind of just to give a platform for all of our participants to share best practices. Um, so overall, I just feel like a high level of communication is key um, when working with our practices. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely communication. I love that you uh, had the drop-in hours and it had a kind of um, platform for people to share and ask questions. So great job there. Thank you. Um, so Rebecca and Nadia this time, um, in thinking about your QI initiatives, what was harder than expected? So I, I can start. I will um, 
you will hear me harp on this a lot, but the few things that we, you know, in our practice, especially has been very difficult. It's keeping up with all the prior authorizations in our goal of starting these medications early. Um, you know, it's, we've had a lot of changes in terms of payers, especially Blue Cross has changed the prior authorization criteria. And so it just makes it a lot more challenging for us to initiate these early because the rules have changed and the guidelines have changed, even though that's not what the ADA guidelines say. Um, that's really a, a real struggle for us. And in addition to that, the medication access and supply is really mm -hmm. hard navigating which medication you can start at which time for which plan, and then having to change that based on what is available at the pharmacy. We run into that a lot where we, you know, would pick a medication. It's either not on the formulary or it's not the preferred, but it's the, the preferred doesn't, is not available. So now we are going back and doing another prior authorization for another medication. Um, and frankly, it's time consuming and exhausting. Couldn't agree more. I think I, I do a party dance when I do not have an in-basket message from a patient saying, I can't find it. What do I do now? So yes, right. I, I empathize with you. It's a lot. And and I, I would, I just, again, continue to say that the additional prior authorization um, rules and requirements make it just that much more challenging because it's not just one time that you have to do it. It's multiple times that you have to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So unfortunately, you're going to hear me say that a lot, but yeah. Well, thank you. Rebecca, how about you? Uh, yeah, I would definitely mirror the uh, availability of the medications and the PAs um, as far as feedback that I received from the practices, um, but also looking at our goal that we set because it wasn't a very broad goal. It was very specific um, in not seeing current, what current data, data looks like. I think the goal that we set might have been a little high and kind of difficult to achieve. Um, Many of our diabetics are already well controlled, so sometimes changing the medications is uh, you know difficult to approach. So in the future, I think we might aim for just more incremental goals rather than a solid um, you know goal that um, is set quite high. Yeah, lessons learned, but always moving forward. So that's yeah, the positive. absolutely. <laughs> All right, thank you. So moving on, this one's for Lindsay. Um, we know there's always competing thoughts of how you should uh, execute goals. And so just wondering um, what barriers did you face? And then how did you arrive at, at buy-in in your practice? Yeah, absolutely. I would have to say um, a lot of the same barriers around the amount of work to get the prior OS, medication availability, and patient satisfaction was a big one. Um, just, you know, they they want these medications, um, so they're willing to switch medications. So providers and pharmacists are trying to have to um, find the dosing conversions. They're not always one-to-one. And then the patients are not always taking them as prescribed. There are some of these pens that are pre-dosed and some that you can um, dose manually. So we're finding that patients are not always taking the full dose and they're kind of hoarding the medications because they know the availability is there. Um, from the provider perspective, um, it, it was it's, it's very time consuming in the office. Um, most of our providers are on board with these medications. The dad is there to support them. I don't think that that's the issue. The main thing is just the availability and the cost. Um, so with the new data, the new research that's come out around some of the benefits of these medications for cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, uh, you know, uh, there, there was definitely, um, we had good buy-in. So that wasn't necessarily the issue. It was more of just the, um, the administration and the cost and the time. All right. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, I just, oh, I think Jake's going back and forth because I was going to try to take a look at the link that Mary posted, um, but maybe Jake, keep me posted if you can uh, eventually, well, maybe share it at the end so we can all look through it. Um, yeah, it may, it may just be it may just be the U of M firewall, but it it wasn't working for me. But if it's working for other okay. folks, please let us know in the chat. Yeah, yeah, and we can kind of switch gears at the end. Ooh. Heidi, I accidentally muted you instead of myself. I'm so sorry. No worries. <laughs> I think I'm unmuted now. <laughs> so Rebecca, turning it back to you. Um, 
what's your biggest takeaway from this kind of first QI exercise? Um, I think that, um, you know, it made me realize that it's okay to review, reevaluate, and reset goals when you're working through process changes and improvements. Um, you know, I for, at this point, we just plan to continue to strive for our open communication with the practices um, through our periodic meetings and check-ins moving forward and um, really pulling in the practices to help set the goal. Yeah, wonderful. And I know, um, Rebecca, we only had you slated to ask this question. I didn't know if any of the others wanted to chime in on this question, because I would love to to hear other takeaways. Sure, this is Kim from Henry Ford. Um, I, I, I guess I'll comment on one of our, our biggest struggles um, and our takeaway was just um, how hard it is with competing priorities because diabetes is one of a multitude of things that the physicians are trying to, there's other CQIs going on, there's other initiatives that are being prioritized. And so I think trying to make this in the forefront, I think sometimes is a little bit challenging. Um, and most patients who have diabetes, it's one of a again, multitude of other chronic diseases. So it, it does make it a little bit challenging to um, to prioritize. Sure. Uh, Nadia, Lindsay, any other thoughts? If not, we can move to the next one. All right. So uh, what changes in your practice planning do you plan to implement next? And I'd love for uh, Kim or Lin and Lindsay to speak on this. Sure. This is this is Kim again. Um, I'm happy to go first. So um, we actually are going to take a pretty um, lofty approach um, next year, and we're we are truly not going to narrow our focus to one of the initiatives. We're actually going to tackle all three of them. And so what we're going to do is we're using some predictive analytics models. And we're using um, proactive outreach to identify patients who are um, due for their A1C or who are currently out of range. So for the patients who do not have a current A1C on file, we are going to do what we are terming bulk outreach and proactively order the lab work and send a letter either through their MyChart portal or in the mail, whichever communication method they've identified. And at that point, then encourage the patient to come in to get that updated. Once they get that updated, that will help us to see kind of how many of the patients are in range, how many of the patients need additional outreach. Um, we've actually been doing this, we started doing this several months ago. Um, we've been doing it on and off for several years, but we've really kind of solidified our practice now. So once the patients are identif identified as being out of target, what we're going to do is we are going to um, set up referrals for them to be seen um, either with DSME and MNT for education and training or through our nurse coaching program to help with medication adherence and optimization. So we, um, our dietitians are all poised to do the low carb eating plan. We offer that with all of our patients, as long as they obviously um, have a medication regimen that supports their ability to be able to do that. Cause we have to be careful with the SGLT2s, mm -hmm. you know, if, what other comorbid conditions do they have, their cultural and ethnic preferences. So we take a look at all of that. And if the patient is identified and willing to start on a low carb, we do that with all of our patients. So we're going to continue that process. Um, we're already working um, to increase the use of CGM. And so that's something that's been ongoing with us. We're just going to go ahead and continue to do that. We actually have a formalized curriculum um, where we do training for patients. It's a one hour appointment. We do their beginning training where they place the CGM. We talk to them one to two days later to make sure their sensor is capturing, whether or not they're having any unidentified hypoglycemia, um, answer any questions, and then we bring them back when they're due to have the sensor changed so we can get that downloaded or uploaded. And 
make sure that they're connected, and then review their patterns to see if we can't help them identify what areas they need to, to work on and perhaps then get them set up with the services that might be beneficial to them. And as far as aligning medications, um, again, we're working with, you know, the physicians will we'll update once the new standards of care are released. Um, we'll go through that. Um, we also have EPIC documentation to match all of these initiatives. And so we're able to track the, the A1Cs, track our outreach, um, look at our beginning numbers, our ending numbers, and kind of see what impact we're able to make overall. So we're, that's what we're going to do with, with all of our practices, both the ones that are enrolled in MCT2D as well as the ones who are not. We're kind of just taking an overall approach. Very impressive. And Jake, I saw you unmute. I, I did see the uh, chat. Um, so thank you. Um, before we turn it over to Lindsay, a couple of things. Uh, Kim, there was a question in chat about billing for these services. Are you able to talk through that? Yes. So we um, we are a group of 16 um, diabetes care and education specialists. Um, and so we are accredited through the American Diabetes Association. And so we are able to drop bills for all of our services for diabetes self-management education, as well as medical nutrition therapy. And then the patients who are on our nurse coaching program, which is kind of a homegrown program, um, we do bill for nurse visits for this. Um, we also are able with our curriculum for CGM, um, just because one of the billing um, requirements to drop charges for CGM is that you have to have three days worth of data to be reviewed. We can charge for a DSME visit for the first um, visit that we see them. We don't charge for the telephone call outreach. And then we drop, um, we can drop the CGM charge for the second visit because we are reviewing patterns and downloading or uploading their um their CGM data. So okay. we do bill for everything. 95251, then you're billing for inter interpretation? You're asking me, we, we can't, we're nurses and dietitians, and so we can't bill interpretation, but there is, um, there's three codes. Two of them are, one is training, and that's the one that we use. But with the training code, you have to, and I don't know the, the numbers off the top of my head. Um, but we can't bill for the interpretation because nurses and dietitians are not allowed to do the interpretation code. That's a provider or, or advanced practice code. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I just, uh, on a side note, um, we just started at Michigan Medicine piloting um, the PharmDs, which are in the same category as you all. And so we um, forward, you can forward a separate telephone encounter to the provider. Um, and so that's how we're uh, kind of piloting this billing and, and working together as a team. So the physician ends up dropping the charge, but the PharmD has essentially set up the entire telephone encounter based on their own visit, which you've billed for. Okay, nice. That's that's a, a, a great thing to keep in mind. Thank you, because yeah. that's additional... <laughs> Additional yeah, revenue yeah. is good. <laughs> it, yes, yes, indeed. And, and we're we're tracking that. So hope to share that. Um, just two quick questions. I'm sorry, Lindsay, for putting you on hold. But Kim, I had a couple of questions. The um, predictive analytic program, is that something built into your Henry Ford EMR or is there a software that you're using? So right now we're pulling things out of Epic and okay. they do, I believe, um, I'm not part of the data poll, so I'm not quite sure what they are using. Um, we've actually been, yeah, it's pretty extensive data, um, yeah. you know, by but insurance, by, been... by, yes, yep, ethnicity, age, geographic area, things of that nature, so that we can hopefully connect people to the, the correct service for them. Okay. And then my... Other question I have is, um, you know, I think one of the beautiful things about our collaborative is um, knowledge is, is sharing. So wondering if on the CGM curriculum, if you'd be willing to share just an outline or whatever you're willing to share so that if others wanted to uh, piggyback and build their own, they could kind of see your framework. I am happy to ask about that. That's not a decision I am able sure. to make. Yeah. Um, you know, we do, our curriculum is based off of, um, the Healthy Interactions curriculum, which is a company that um, has been around for quite a while. 
and um, with ADA in order to be accredited, you have to base your curriculum off of a proven uh, standard of care. And okay. so we can't just pull that, pull it out of our hat. <laughs> it right. has to be based off something evidence-based. So yeah. I am happy to ask if we are able to share that. Yeah. Um, and if we are, I will, I will let you know, I'll write that down. The director of the program is actually off until July 8th. So I won't be able to get back to you before then. No, just as I, an FYI. Yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate that. And, you know, I think just looking for maybe highlights of, of categories and or how you went about identifying healthy interactions, I think for any of those on the call that might be wanting to do a similar thing, just knowing your process would be great. Sure. Yep. We use healthy interactions for a lot of, for our full DSME curriculum, we use that. It's a, it's a conversational um, learning style. It's not didactic. And so um, we basically utilize that to meet the patient where they are, as opposed to giving them a handout and just regurgitating information. And so we use that to generate a conversation. And so that's basically the model that, that healthy interactions uses. So, okay. Yep. Thank you, Kim. Yes. <laughs> All right, Lindsay, turning it over to you, if you can discuss the changes in your practice that you hope to implement next. Yeah, sure. Um, we are also looking at CGM utilization at this point and how we're going to move forward with that with the new um, prior off um I don't want to say gold carding, but the prior auth uh, privileges that we get yeah. through this program um, that is on our radar. So we're going to start looking at that and kind of getting a plan in place. So that will be one of our major next steps. We've been working with our pharmacists and we've developed some handouts. They're just one pagers that we've distributed to our offices on a pharmacy how to guide. And it really outlines um, how to go about um, GLP-1 and GLP-1 GPI shortages. So um, any medications that are currently on um, a shortage, how do you manage them? You know, recommendations for um, if the AC, A1C is between 1% and 2% above goal or less than 2% above goal. And then again, those dosing conversions. So they've put together a nice table um, of dosing conversions for those specific medications that may have shortages. So we've been working with our practices, getting everyone educated and updated on those sorts of things. And then we're also um, thinking about as Blue Cross has changed the coverage for these medications, um, we are going, how we're going to work with our providers to, um, to educate and, and maybe have some alternative medications that, that may help um, in that category for, for weight loss. Again, just for patient satisfaction. So that's kind of what's on our radar. So we're, we're, um, we are looking at implementing um, a CGM criteria. We have also um, pulled data such as um, Kim was speaking to as, as those patients that don't have an A1C on file. We have also pulled a recent ADT feed um, for anyone that may have had um, any ED or inpatient diagnoses, rated uh, discharge diagnose, diagnoses related to um, hypo or hyperglycemia. Um, and we also use healthy interactions. So our care management team and our um, nurse diabetes educator are very familiar with healthy interactions. And we also use uh, that, that particular program. Wonderful. Um, and so music to my ears, I actually this week have been working on updating our uh, GLP shortage guide that has a likely a similar table um, for GLP conversions. And so I'm hoping to get that out in the next month for you all. Um, focusing on some literature, there was a um, special report uh, published last summer by uh, Whitney and colleagues. Um, so more to come on that front. And so Lindsay would love to see if there's uh, any crossover or ways we can combine things too. All right, so yes. All right, so this question we're gonna have three answers on from Kim, Nadia, and Lindsay. Just wondering from a policy perspective, what is needed to operationalize guideline-directed medication prescribing? I think we've talked about it a little, but just would love to hear more thoughts on this. 
who would like to go first? I can, um, you know, again, going back and, and harping on the prior auth and the prior auth criteria, you know, I, I think from a policy perspective, especially for MC T2T offices, and we've had now like so much training on this, I think kind of moving forward and pushing for fewer prior authorizations, fewer criteria, um, even things that say like, oh, you know, does this patient have diabetes, for example, you know, on, on one hand, it's like, well, it's a really easy and quick thing to just check off. But that's also something that, you know, they could pull from claims data as, you know, recent A1Cs or, or other data that we don't necessarily have to go in and log into a new system and make sure that we're clicking boxes and checking boxes to get these medications that we need. And so, you know, that's one of the things that our office would love to see. Um, we would love to see removal of requirements of making sure they've tried multiple medications before we can use, you know, the medications that we know are beneficial for cardiovascular health, for kidney health. Um, that's our, that's our biggest piece here. Okay. I appreciate that. Kim, I, I can go next. I, I think Nadia has hit the nail on the head, but um, in addition to that, I would have to add that um, we have to really treat our lines of business separately for, especially when we're looking at, um, obviously now with the with the new changes, it'll be different. But previously, um, when we looked at our commercial line of business, we could <clears throat> we could easily um, target those those patients that maybe wanted to use these medications for weight loss, and that is not the case on the MA side of the house. And those patients were finding a lot of our doctors advocating that that that's really the patient population that could benefit um, from these medications in a weight loss perspective because they have a lot of other um, comorbidities, maybe not diabetes, but other comorbidities that were you know that they could definitely see a benefit from. So I think not just you know aligning the prior offs, but um, getting Medicare on board too. Um, hopefully with the new data that's out there, they'll start to see some of the benefits and things will change. But um, right now that's not the case. Yeah. I was just at the ADA last week and um, obviously a, a heavy topic of conversation with so many plans on the obesity front now, um, you know, limiting and or annexing coverage of GLPs. And so um I think we all have our work cut out for us. I think uh, anytime I get in front of anybody involved in industry, I, I convey stop expanding labeling, get the drugs out there for our patients with type 2 diabetes, and let's talk about pricing. You keep expanding the labeling, you're, you're making plenty of money. So um, I think health plans are in a position, unfortunately, because these drugs are so expensive to be putting us all through what we're going through. And so I think a call to action, um, I... I continue to be a loud voice in this setting. So just encourage you all to do that too, if you're in the position to do so. Kim, what would you like to share? Well, most of what I wanted to share was already said. So I guess <laughs> we all seem to be on the same page, but basically it was just simplifying the process in general. And so some of the things like less cumbersome forms, less information that's needed and really, um, hoping that the evidence-based medicine catches up to let's do the right thing for the patient and kind of put some of the other things aside. So um, that basically is it just, you know, taking away some of the burden. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so many factors in that, in that uh, lift, I think. All right. Heidi, I'm sorry, before we move on, cause I, I got a, um, a little bit of a question for you. So this yeah, is something yeah. that um, you know, our office has kind of talked about a lot in terms of like, how do we appropriately advocate for our patients on this level? Because this is something where, you know, we are in the base of, in, in the business of advocating for what is right for the patient. Yep. We understand that cost is a huge factor, right? Yep. Um, but if, if you have ideas, you know, we've tried to touch base with Blue Cross and say like, hey, you know, we need to talk about this and we need to see, you know, from our perspective that you understand what's going on here, um, you know, from the patient facing side. So if, if you have ideas and I know Heather, um, I'm, I'm going to 
to kind of have Heather chime in too from our office because this is we we talk about this all the time. Um, yeah. If you have any good ideas for how we can be good advocates, that would be amazing. Yeah, I mean, I think right now we're at a rock and a hard place kind of situation because I, in the talks that we've had uh, with payers specifically, it's not it's not about. Um, that patient voice, they, they know, they know it's not, they, they understand it comes down, unfortunately, to the economics. Um, and so that's why I've kind of pivoted a bit. I still continue to talk when we're talking to payers, um, you know, especially on this obesity front, just completely annexing patients who might have BMIs that don't even qualify for bariatric surgery. You know, that's not good patient care. Um, so yeah, I think, I think just being a, a squeaky wheel at all and when you're facing anybody that might have a line to helping our patients, whether that's a payer, and especially every time I'm asked to meet with somebody from industry, I don't, you know, if it's a medical liaison or anybody, um, you know, I kind of tell them from the get-go, I'm not interested to hear anything about, like I said, expanded labeling. I want to know what you're doing about pricing because patients are not getting these drugs and supply. And you know, it might shut down the conversation pretty quick, but the message is getting out there. So, uh, I have, Heidi, this is Heather. I work with Nadia. I yeah. have a question about, we, we saw the switch in the CGM coverage as being part of the program, right? Yep. It was really a delight to see that yes. it seemed like our voices were heard yes. and that there was some alignment of the values, right? Yep. Yep. So, so I think what, what we are, what we hear on this call today is that from all different types of practices, from large systems like Henry Ford to small practices like ours to university settings, um, the red tape is what's really a burden. And, you know, I said this at the last meeting and I'll keep saying it, but if we, if we can be pointed in the specific direction of where we can lobby for ourselves and our patients, participation in this program has been so valuable that having unrestricted access to evidence-based tools for our patients is all we're asking for. And yeah. that's not crazy. And no. considering we're going to have to start fighting for people to have access to anti-obesity treatment, which is also not crazy. Right. Um, it would be nice to have something to be less hard. So yeah. I'm hopeful that with the CGM shift, there has been some productive conversation. And, you know, there was a very good overview in the New York Times last week about PBMs. Yep. and cost. And if you, if, I, if you don't know it, it's worth reading and understanding because when we're talking with the, we do have access to reps, they do come in. And um, I don't know that they always understand the PBM thing, but the cost yeah. is so far above any of our roles in healthcare, except that we're a large group of people providing care. Yeah. So, um, you know, if there's something that comes up, if there's something legislative that comes up, if there's something that we can be a part of, like, I think everybody in this call would be happy to do it. But um, it's because you guys have done such a good job that we're, we're in a bit of a quandary. So, you know, we under, I understand the anti-obesity piece is going to be a hard hill to, hill to climb until they bring costs down. Yep. But for diabetics, we should be able to treat for the guidelines at our discretion, unrestricted access. Yeah, I think so. I I hear you. And I think for the most part, we are like they're not stopping coverage or limiting. I think the, the problem is, how do they assure the payers that the patient you're prescribing for has diabetes and not obesity? And so, yes, Nadia, to your your point, claims data. I, I think I need a better understanding of how all these intricacies work with, you know, from the moment the prescription leaves our EMR and goes to the pharmacy, like whatever system it goes out to for prior authorization. Um, so I, I think it's, I get the feeling it's not as simple as a, a flip of a switch, um, because I think if it was, they would they would be on our side. So they know these are evidence-based medicines for our patients. Also patient. not just because they're worried that the wrong people are getting medication, right? It's not yeah. just like, as we are as we are prescribing, our intention should be to make sure our diabetics have access to medication. That's our obligation yeah. is to prescribe per guidelines, right? Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. This but is I about think... cost on their end. This is a way that they can restrict access because of cost. And- I their, their hope always is that we just won't try. 
Yeah, I, I, um, I'm a thousand percent with you. Um, I think the thought that everybody out there is prescribing in line. Um, well, they're not. I mean, we know they're that not. they're not. We all know that they're not. But that, right. the, the policing of prescribers is a tricky thing. It totally and is. Yeah. These prescription, this this class in this world we just stepped into is not going away. No. Um, but, you know, we do, maybe it's a different conversation and maybe it needs to be, how can we provide the clinical information on the prescription so that things can get filled? Correct. Because it is yeah. that we're yeah. all, we're all like everybody on this call talked about how hard, you know, how hard the prior yeah. offs are. Oh, yeah. So, Absolutely. you know, but, but I, I think always my experience with insurance companies, when I have to get on a phone call or take extra time to do something, if I don't succeed, they don't have to pay. Yeah. I have to succeed because my patient needs it. Yeah. I think it's so, also quite interesting if we take the look at the two classes. So if you compare GLPs with SGLT2s, um, we don't have as much red tape with SGLT2s. Why? No, no. It's 300 bucks, right? It's no. not $1,500. And so we get back to the same problem. I, I do think one thing I'm walking away with that perhaps we could, um, that I will try to speak to is in the current status of the shortage, this repeated prior authorization, if they already have a prior authorization for a GLP, so it's been confirmed that they have diabetes, we need to, I will ask to see what we can do about, like if we're switching uh, GLP simply because patient can't find the one they're prescribed, that seems to me some low hanging fruit that perhaps they could figure out how to automate. That would be um, amazing. So I would appreciate I, all of it. That would be you. fabulous. Even, even to say like the, the, the starting choice, right? Like we understand formularies. We understand that the payer yeah. you know, has to make certain decisions based on their contracts. We understand that, but at yeah. the same time, we know some of these are just not available in, right. in the moment. Well, and, and for the most part, the evidence-based ones, you know, with cardiovascular data are all covered. Um, so it's getting, you know, working around all the nuances, but, um, I really appreciate, uh, this conversation. And the next time I'm given the opportunity, I will certainly uh, see some thoughts on what might be done to for that specific problem. I, I, I wish I could solve the bigger issue, but <laughs> um, I will just con continue to advocate. All right. Um, that was such a wonderful conversation. I think Yes, we're on to our last slide. So uh, for Kim and Nadia, um, what is one thing that we, um, maybe outside of what I just said, we could do at MCT2D um, to help you achieve your goals with guideline-directed uh, medication prescribing? So this is Kim. I um, One thing that I, I do believe may help would be if we could do some type of a letter writing campaign to the legislatures and the policymakers. I know for those of you who belong to um, AADCES, they have a form letter. You can go onto their website, you type in your name and your zip code, and it brings up a form letter, and it brings up both your state representative and your senator. And if you just press send, it sends them both a letter advocating for them to sign the bill for Medicare to allow virtual visits to continue for diabetes education. So if MCT2D could develop something similar to that, where we're writing policymakers about trying to affect change with prices of medications, trying to affect change of you know coverage options and reducing some of the barriers, you could almost build this into the physician's VBR requirements. And if they do this and we speak up as a voice and our voice is so large that this, I, I think, may be a little bit helpful with um, getting the word out there even more. Yeah, I love that idea, Kim. Um, I'm not a member. Um, I'm wondering if perhaps 
I don't know um, if those of you on this call would be interested in, in forming a little subcommittee, because if we could if we could gather those of you that might be members of various organizations to get some ideas, and then I can go um, back to our design team to see how we might operationalize this. Um, I, I am a firm believer that that could make a huge difference. Um, so Kim, I don't know if you're willing to uh, start it out. I'm willing to join you. And if anybody else wants to, um, perhaps you can put in chat if you'd be willing to uh, join us and just get this ball rolling. It, it, the, the one that I've done it a couple times for um, the organization, and it literally takes 30 seconds. It, it's just a matter of typing your name, your zip code, and pushing send. Okay. So um, um, I'd be interested, maybe, and you and I can set up a different email to see if we could share screens so you could show me what AADCS yes. has. So yep. um, because then I could perhaps try to figure out how we can build that into our MCT2D website, a similar um, thing like that. Yep. Yep. Happy. So, okay. and then the other thing I had was, and I know it's a work in progress, the MCT2D app. Um, they're working on that, but just putting links in there with um, a link to the most recent ADA guidelines and then a lot of the nice resources that are developed that are on the website, if it could also be included in the app, it, it sometimes, I think the providers have a tendency to use their phone a yeah. lot when they're looking for things. So those are just two other app suggestions that, but so far the beginning app looks great. Okay. I appreciate uh, appreciate that feedback. Um, the one thing I do want to add is uh, we had, and Jake, I don't know if you remember which PO, the, um, we had a poster at regional meetings that was for low carb. It was black and it had various like pictures of the um, resources we have plus the QR code. And the practice made keychains, which was so cool. They laminated it so people could just kind of scan the different options. So just some really cool things that practices are doing out there with our resources to increase use and, and ease of use. Oh, I love that because that could go on the back of a badge or something. Yes, yes. So okay. cool. So yeah. they made like a QR code with it? Well, the, the poster that I'm speaking of has the QR code on it. Um, okay. And so it's just, I, I think essentially what they did is they took the, our poster, cut them into little like segments and then laminated those. Yeah, it was from Rachel Walter at Metropel. Um, Metropel. And, I can, wow. and I can show a quick image of this. Yeah, thank you, Jake. Yeah, give me one second while it opens. This is what it looked like. They'd cut up the poster and put the relevant sections on keychains. Uh, for patients with all of the various QR, QR codes for those sections. And it, they laminated it. Yeah. So Jake, maybe what I'm thinking is um, maybe a July, August project might be building a poster for CGMs and medications similar to this mock-up. And then we could do a, a similar thing. That might be kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Nadia, I, I, I didn't forget about you. Um, if you wanted to share I your thoughts. To. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, uh, I, I really love this advocacy idea. Um, Kim, like you, you know, I know Heather already said, but you have my full support as well. I, I'd love to be a part of this because I think that's something that we can do together as a group. And that's part of the benefit of having a group such as ours. Um, you know, the only other thing is really just going back to the basics of, of what the guideline says and, and the support from MCT to T to go back to the payers and say, you know, the additional criteria of needing to try multiple other medications before you can try this um, is, is very frustrating. And so going, going back to that would be great. I mean, I I've even, I've shared before, I'll, I will share it again, even because this really frustrated me. You know, I had one patient where a pair came back to me and said, the patient can't, cannot have a GLP-1 because the patient has already prescribed um, basal bolus insulin. And there's no data to say that, that a patient can be on uh, oh. bolus insulin and a GLP-1 at the same time. And I, I genuinely almost lost it. Like it was just a, an extraordinarily frustrating thing to appeal and go back to multiple times for. 
Um, so, so that removing that is huge, and and we've talked about it again at length. But I think going back and understanding the interlink and intersectionality between obesity and, and diabetes is huge. You know, if we can start treating people and really work on this prevention, which we talk about a lot in terms of diabetes prevention programs and things like that, but we can we we then turn around and treat obesity as if it's a completely different thing. And, oh, we're using these medications for obesity and not for diabetes. But but we know preventing diabetes makes a world of difference. And I think if we can start looking at it at that lens, like th these are not two totally separate things. Oh. That would be very helpful, you know? Yeah. So um, taking lots of notes over here. So thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> All right, I was just skimming through chat to see if I um, missed anything. Jake, we'll have a, the transcript so I know who we can message out to to form this subcommittee. Yep, we'll have the transcript of the chat, so we'll be able to check that. All right, so nine minutes remain. I know we're all busy people. Um, is there any other comments from the audience, questions, or I can give you nine minutes back to your day? And then just another quick shout out, if you've not already done the sign in, please do the sign in. I'm going to put it in the chat one final time here for us. Um, if you've had trouble with this, please email me directly and we'll be able to assist. All right, all. Well, I hope you have a fabulous weekend, a fabulous upcoming 4th of July holiday. And um, I know we have a lot of work to do, but I am so thankful to have all of you uh, to help with, um, with this. So I look forward to what's yet to come. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Heidi, are you going to outreach to me to set up a meeting then? or? Yeah, um, okay. Kim, I think, um, Jake, once we get the um, committee together, Actually, Mary, do you want to put your email in? Because I'll just send you an email right now so I don't forget. And maybe you and I can meet and then we can meet with a broader subcommittee after that. You want me to put my email in right now? Yeah, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind. Okay, so you are also, I just wanted to make sure if there was anything that I was supposed to do, but I'll wait till you outreach to me then. Yeah, um, just okay. give me one second because my copy paste function has been a little wonky at times. So I'm just putting it into an email. Got it. All right. I think we're good. So I look forward to talking to you um, and then we'll form this committee. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Jake, I think. We're probably good. Yep, we're good. I'm just hanging on to make sure nobody else had a, anybody had issues with sign in, but otherwise, okay. we're good to go. All right. Well, thanks for tag teaming with me. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Bye, everybody.